Hi. Um, so my name is Michael Stockel. Um, and I'm here to tell you um, how we screwed up basically two years ago and what we learned out of it. Um, I was working there, um, back there, in a company, and it's basically the biggest web page of Germany. Um, and we had a simple task. We should build a recommender system for our web page. And we thought, yeah, cool, let's try out all the cool new technology and build a recommender with the amount of data we have. And we came up with one, and after two weeks implementation, uh, we delivered our first um, recommender with an A-B test. Everything looked good. We even had a, like a increase a time on the page of 14%, and the people were clicking like crazy on our links. So we went to our managers and told them, OK, release it. We, we need it now. We are losing money when we don't do it. However, after releasing it, um, some friends of us were asking us, OK, what are you doing there? Um, it's totally shit, um, and you're only showing porn stuff. Um, where formerly there was real content, now it's porn. Um, and we were totally underestimating the users um, with our user-based recommender. Um, another story is I was working for um, another company where uh, we had a task classifying documents. So when there is um, an invoice, we should classify it as an invoice. If there's a contract, we should classify it as a contract, and so on. Um, and we basically had only one big customer, um, and this customer was their German mail delivery. And the CEO of this German mail delivery uh, was testing our system. And we prepared like crazy, shipped a new uh, model right before their uh, milestone. And then their user again, the CEO, did what we didn't expect it. Uh, it used it in a way that we uh, wouldn't um, assume. And basically, he uploaded some drawings of Van Gogh um, to our system. And we were classifying everything as an invoice because our um, machine learning algorithm basically overfitted to invoices because we wanted to make sure that the invoice case works. So the managers, again, were not super happy with us. In both cases, the problem was basically we, our test data did not really match our live data. Um, so we had assumptions in our test uh, set which basically um, the user don't care about. And we have to make sure that the, the live data um, is tested and not the test set itself. Another problem, especially in the first case, was that we deployed something um, to production, and it's been there for a while. User could make some stuff, um, and then it broke totally um, And until we got the real feedback from the user that it's broke. Um, it was too late for us to see, OK, this was the commit we made, uh, which really broke um, our whole system. And the last problem was that we were not able to reproduce um, what we did before we deployed the stuff. So basically, it was cowboy style. We um, hacked a, a model together, deployed it, and hoped the best. Um, so we totally forgot which, uh, which test sets we used. We forgot um, which hyperparameters uh, we trained. And so fixing a bug was always uh, redoing it all, uh, all over again. Um, yeah, now I'm at Unternehmertum, um, and I had time to think about, OK, how could we improve the situation um, for us and also for our startups? Shortly about Unternehmertum, um, what is Unternehmertum? Stanf uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung claims that we are the Stanford of Bavaria. Um, basically, we are a nonprofit um, entrepreneurship se center which tries to help startups in every stage uh, to become successful. So we help them with their first idea uh, and teaming up um, until venture capital and help them to build secure, uh, scalable companies. In addition to that, we also work together with uh, a lot of big corporates to help them to stay competitive and innovative. For example, some of our partners are uh, BMW, Daimler, and Audi. And also on the tech side, like Google and Facebook are our partners. Um, and we have some cool projects like Hyperloop. Um, we built some robots, uh, stuff like that. So um, if you're interested in high tech, uh, check out Unternehmertum. So how do we actually release a model um, with our startups? And I will use the, the example of um, the document classifier 
as an example uh, to go through the whole process. So the most important st uh, step in, in the machine learning pipeline is always a pre-processing. So we have to make sure that the data is clean enough um, and fits to our model. Um, we use Kafka to, to store our training data. Uh, we have like a first one which stores the raw data. And we pre-process it uh, in two ways, like one for a training set and one for a test set. Um, and we name the topics with the git commit of the preprocessor to make sure that we always know um, which one we use and also that we can uh, roll back and we don't have clashing names of our topics. Um, this works pretty good um, as long as you don't change anything in the preprocessor. If you change the preprocessor, um, everything has to recalculate it. Um, the whole pipeline has to go through again. Um, so this is kind of one of the bottlenecks um, we're facing right now. And so somebody uh, pushes some code to production, uh, or not to production, but uh, to Git, and we train a candidate out of the training data set. This is pretty normal. Um, our data scientists or engineers can do that um, also locally, so they have access to the training uh, topics. Um, so they can build with the real data we're using also for the build process um, locally, which makes it much easier for them to feel like they would work um, in production. As soon as we've got our candidate model, um, we use the live model, which is like currently live, and rerun the whole uh, test again, just to make sure that it's, um, like, or to have a baseline, because um, our test set is always evolving. Uh, we're using different test sets all the time, um, to make sure that we don't uh, overfit in one uh, direction. And so we create another baseline for our new model to see whether it's better or worse than the old one. So we just rerun everything um, again. And then we do the same for the new model. So we, we evaluate the new model and then we compare because we don't really know how good is good in our production system, but we assume everything which is better than the old one is are really nice to have. Um, so when it's better than the old one, we go with this one. If it's slightly um, or comparable, um, perhaps we just try it out. Um, and when it's worse, then we don't even try it out. So we go on with that. Like in the case when it's it's good enough, we we tag it in our Git history as a good model, and we publish it to um, our object storage. Um, as also IBM is one of our partners, we're using IBM um, for that. But you can use basically everything like S3 um, or something like that. Okay, until now this is pretty basic uh, and even the research is doing that. So they're using um, a training set, they're using a test set, they compare it to see which one is better. And this is like basically what we also done before. Um, but we want to test our model in production and see how it behaves there. For that, we built a real service with the model. Um, so we decoupled um, the service from the model itself to make sure that a data scientist can work independently from um, an app developer. And this, again, works as long as you don't change the preprocessor. But it gives you some kind of um, independencies between the two disciplines. So when either the, the app developer or the data scientist wants to uh, push something, we merge the branch, um, we build a Docker image, pull the, the model, and then we run basic um, unit tests and integration tests. Then we make sure to include some corner cases we expect, for example, create a Van Gogh drawing, um, and to see whether it's always an other, other document and not an invoice, because um, some corner cases should not happen in production. And it's basically a real unit test. But most of the time, you cannot really um, test your model with unit tests or integration tests, because they behave sometimes strange, um, not always as predicted. Um, so you will have a lot of failing tests if you do test everything with unit tests. 
Um, so we just make sure that like, the basic functionality stays the same. Um, if I would sell ads, I would make sure that the highest paid ad is always recommended, for example. When all the te uh, tests pass, uh, we publish the model to um, our container registry, um, again on IBM, and then it's accessible for our Kubernetes cluster. Um, and we simply run a deployment um, for our service uh, in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so the deployment makes sure that there's always three instances running. Um, and when we change the model uh, or the service, that it's done in a way that the user doesn't notice. So it first removes one instance, um, starts the new one, see whether it works, um, and goes to the second one, and so on. And the classification is pretty simple. So we have an, an incoming uh, topic where all the data is stored in a pre-processed way. Then their service itself is just classifying the stuff and outputs it into a live um, topic. To test a new model, we deploy a, a canary instance. And it basically does the same. It just um, published the stuff into a canary um, topic. So the live doc types will uh, serve the web page. And the canary will be like, there is nothing to surf from. But both topics basically contain the same information. Um, it's just a model which did the uh, prediction, which is different. And to find like examples where we have a classification where we're not sure about, uh, we join the two topics and have a spot checker input queue. Um, and also, like again, spot checking is pretty simple. Um, we take the examples where the two models cannot agree on a talk type, and we show it to the one who deploys. Or if it's more uh, domain knowledge involved, we show it to somebody um, who can classify the stuff. So in this case, um, a human being should tell me if it's an invoice, a contract, or other. Um, and we go through a couple of them. Uh, it always depends how, how many uh, documents we need to see a difference between the two models. In that way, we kind of build up our test data automatically. Um, so with every deployment, our test, uh, test data set grows, uh, which is cool, but it does not work if you have to comply to some data privacy issues. Um, so as long as no user data is involved, um, this can work to build up your test data set. And then it's basically just a decision based on a dashboard. So the one who deploys looks at a dashboard and makes an educated guess whether it's better or, or not. Um, so there's just like um, a part of it here, but we, for example, monitor what is the precision on the live system based on, um, on user feedback. So whenever we see a drop in the, like the precision of user feedback, we might want to do something. Um, when we deploy, or at the beginning of the deployment, we also check whether uh, the canary and the live prediction have the same distribution on the test set, because we know the distribution on the test set, and it should not really be different um, on the two models. If there is a big difference, we better don't deploy the stuff. Um, because this was the case um, with our invoice, uh, classify everything as an invoice. We would have seen it on a tested distribution already. Um, and this is basically the last step. Um, these are the classifications of the spot checker. Um, and as we taking mainly examples where the two differs, um, you pretty qu quickly see which one is better um, on the tested, uh, on the live data. Um, and in this case, it was pretty safe to deploy um, the new version, although we didn't have like a lot of examples running.
And then we deploy it. Um, we still monitor it because then the, the new one is in production and all the production metrics apply to this one. And like after a couple of hours, we assume that it's OK. Um, depends always on the traffic. So with startups, it's most of the time pretty difficult because they don't have too much traffic. Um, but you cannot destroy too much with a startup um, because they don't have users anyway. Not all of them. Um, like it's working pretty good with most of their like use cases where we're using it, um, but there are some limitations. Um, as I already mentioned, when you like change the preprocessor, um, it's kind of difficult to um, make sure that it's still working, that not one of the um, classifiers is crashing. Um, the data privacy might be an issue. Like in our case, it was not a problem because we um, anonymize every document anyway right in the beginning. This was like one requirement of the um, German mail delivery service. Um, so we could store just anonymized features, and that's good. Um, and it basically only works for classification use cases where a human being can tell whether this is this class or that one. So we have another application right now. It's about predictive maintenance for trucks. And we do it based on the Canvas data. Uh, and we want to predict two weeks in advance um, whether this truck will break down or not. Um, and I have no clue about Canvas data. And when I see it, it's basically um, nothing for me. So we cannot really tell based on sample, samples whether the classification was right or wrong. We can only tell after two weeks. And when a truck breaks down after two weeks with some precious load, and we didn't know that, might be not good for our startup. So we are currently working on that. Uh, and if you want to have more details, there is Anastasia, who is basically working on that. <laughs> um, so ask her if you want to get more information about this uh, use case. And that's all I wanted to tell you. Like, if you have more questions, uh, come afterwards or reach me out on email or Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Hi, I'm just curious about if a new artifact type arrives, what happens to this system? Like in, in case when contract invoices and maybe some other artifact type arrives. So we change the entire pre-processing uh, thing and I mean that entire pipeline changes? You mean when we introduce new classes or? Like what happens? When we introduce new classes or do you mean something else? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Um, when we introduce new classes, basically we start all over again. Um, okay. Because most of the other documents uh, might be one of these documents. Um, and if we train with like other is this type of document, um, it will have some precision, uh, precision problems. Um, so at least we try to find the, um, the classes in the other documents okay. um, and we run like create all the topics new. Okay. It was the same with their um, with their the web page where we build a recommender. Um, we had to classify whether a content is good or not. And first we trained with three classes like good, bad and medium. And then our um, product owner wanted to have good medium, bad, and delete. Um, and it's really hard to like train stuff if everything is marked as bad, um, if there's a new delete class. Uh, perhaps there is some overlapping stuff going on there. Last question. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.